Have you ever lost a game in Feudal Age? Chances are, if you had designed your base better, you would have been more likely to not die. Walls are a great way to cheaply repel or delay the opponent's army. They only work if they're constructed in the right way at the right time, though. If you make your walls too early, then you won't have as many resources to get to Feudal Age or to spend on military early. This can lead to your opponent getting the initiative from the start of the game. It's a lot easier to macro when there aren't enemies running around your base. Walling too much too early will pretty much guarantee that your opponent will be the aggressor and you the defender. If you wall too late, then your opponent might reach your walls before they're completed, which is the worst case scenario because you've now wasted a ton of resources on useless walls and maybe lost your walling villager. Knowing what factors to account for when planning your walls is the focus of this video. These factors include what type of walls to use, positions of resources, potential TC locations, your opening in relation to your opponent's opening, and the civilization matchup. To start it off, let's look at what a wall can be made out of. Of course, palisade and stone walls could be used, but apart from being an obstruction, these constructions have no function. It's more cost effective to use other buildings that you are going to build anyways as part of your wall. In addition to buildings, you can also incorporate natural resources into your wall. If you're using resources as part of your wall, you have to be careful to add more walls when those resources are collected, otherwise you'll have a hole. So, for building materials, we have cheap palisade and stone walls, more expensive but multi-purpose buildings such as houses and production buildings, and resource nodes that don't cost anything but we can't choose their location. On some maps, there's also water and cliffs. These have similar considerations as for resources like forest and ores. For water, the main difference is that you can only wall on the shore with palisade walls, stone walls, or docks. Enemies can also be transported through the water, so if you don't wall the shoreline, then you're not completely walled. When choosing which material to wall with, first consider the locations of your natural resources. It's good to use these as they're free, but since you can't change their location, you have to plan the rest of your walls around these. Usually it's wood lines that you're using, as these cover the most area. A 4-tile gold is insignificant when compared to a 20-tile wood line. The next material to use is the multi-purpose buildings that you'll be building anyways. After the first two houses that you place quickly around your TC, you usually place two more houses and a barracks in Dark Age. Sometimes you can use your mill or mining camp as part of your wall as well. You don't have to just place houses as you need them. If you want to fortify a shorter part of your wall, making it completely out of houses can be worth it. If you build too many houses, then it can delay your stable, archery range, or most importantly, farms, so don't go too crazy while making houses as part of your initial wall. The final material to consider is, of course, the palisade wall. This is the cheapest and weakest building that you can use on your wall, but it should still give enough time for you to react if an enemy attacks it. Use palisade walls to complete your walls when you don't want to spend extra wood on more expensive buildings. Remember, you can always place houses and other buildings behind your palisade walls as the game goes on, so palisade walls only have to get you through the early game. If you full wall your base, then when you want to move out, you'll need a place to leave your base. Palisade gates can be built to let your units through while still restricting enemy movement. The problems with palisade gates are that they cost 30 wood, which is about the same cost as a house and two palisade walls which cover the same area. They only have two pierce armor, which makes them the only walling material to take more than one damage from archers, and they have a lot of surface area which lets more enemies attack them at once. The gate is the weakest point in your wall, which is why higher level players often just delete a palisade wall when they want to move out with their army, and then just replace it once their army's on the map. The stronger stone walls and gates are the least common material, as they can only be built in Feudal Age, which doesn't help when the opponent already has army at your base in early Feudal Age. The other disadvantage to these stone constructions is the cost. 
If you spend any of your stone on walls, then you'll have to collect stone in order to get two additional town centers in Castle Age. Instead of stone walls, houses are usually enough to keep the enemy out of your base. One instance where you might need to use stone walls is when you get an oasis that can't be walled with multi-purpose buildings. As I said earlier, the shoreline can only be walled with palisade walls, stone walls, and docks. If a palisade wall is not going to be strong enough to keep the enemy back, then stonewalling just two tiles may be necessary. If you really want a gate on your walls, then sometimes placing a stone gate can be better than a palisade gate because it doesn't have the problem of being easy to destroy. Of course, you still have to collect 30 stone if you want to make your town centers, but if your plan isn't even to make town centers, then making a stone gate can be good, even if it looks weird. Now that we know what we can build our walls out of, let's look at three different wall designs that we can use. The first design is the smallest and cheapest. Resource walls are used to keep early melee units from attacking your villagers while they collect resources. They're built to stall the opponent's military while you get your own military in position to defend, or while you attack the opponent and don't want to take damage while your units are across the map. Usually you use palisade walls for this, but you can also incorporate houses into your resource walls. The next design is called small walls. These are medium size, medium cost walls. Instead of just controlling the area where the villagers are working, these walls cover the area between your resource drop-off camp and the town center. This prevents the enemy from encircling your camp and trapping villagers. Against ranged units, small walls can be necessary. The small wall design is very map and strategy dependent, but we'll get into the details later. Your small walls should be made out of stronger buildings on the front, and palisade walls closer to the town center. The walls don't have to connect at the town center, but should be closed everywhere else. Since players will attack the weakest point in your walls, making the weak points far enough from your villagers that your villagers won't be in immediate danger if your opponent attacks there, and close enough that you can make a second layer of walls behind is how you should make your walls. In other words, use multi-purpose buildings to wall very far and very close from your villagers, and palisade walls to wall the rest. The final type of wall is the base wall. This covers your base completely and is probably what you think of when you picture full walls. This is the most expensive and longest to build design. It can be the safest as well, but if your walls are too big, they can also be difficult to repair or wall behind if they're in a remote location. Since they're bigger, you'll have to use more palisade walls leading to more weak points. Base walls are used when you want to play greedier or more defensive. Since you're investing so many resources into your walls, you may struggle to have a large military presence. If you have forward gold or berries, then sometimes the best way to secure these resources is with base walls. With base walls, you really have to make sure that you're building all of your multi-purpose buildings on your wall to strengthen it. Getting your production buildings in front of your main gold if it's forward will prevent enemy archers from harassing your gold miners from a good position. Even if you don't go for base walls initially, you can finish your walls sometime after early feudal age to give yourself an extra layer of safety. Speaking of extra layers, when you have to wall behind against an enemy attack, you should either use multi-purpose buildings or stone walls. A second layer of palisade walls is often too weak in this situation. This also applies to strengthening your walls. Instead of double layering palisade walls, if you want to beef up your walls, just build some houses behind. Alright, just to recap, the walling materials that you can use are natural resources, palisade and stone walls, and multi-purpose buildings. The wall designs we've gone over are resource walls, small walls, and base walls. With that said, let's take a look at some map generations in the scenario editor to see different types of maps that we can encounter. We'll just be looking at Arabia Generations, as this is the most common map, but since it also has a lot of variety between generations, the walling concepts that we'll go over can be applied on many other maps as well. The most important feature to consider when determining how to wall is how many wood lines there are close to your base, and therefore how open your map is. The number of close wood lines can range from seemingly none to four. The less wood you have closer to your town center, the more open the map is. The more open the map, the more buildings you have to place to complete your walls. If your map is too open, trying to place too many walls early can end up hurting you more than helping you. The less you have to wall, the more effective they will be. 
On maps with four wood lines, you'll end up spending considerably less resources to make base walls compared to a map with only two. On this map with four wood lines, I had to cover 50 tiles to fully wall my base. Using just palisade walls, this cost 150 wood for the walls and 490 seconds of villager work time, which is equivalent to about 200 wood if the villager was chopping wood instead. The total cost for this wall is about 350 wood, or around 850 villager work seconds. Let's compare that to a map with only two wood lines and more space that needs to be covered. There were 75 tiles of palisade walls that needed to be made, which took 688 seconds to build and cost 225 wood. The total cost for these walls is 507 wood, or 1236 villager work seconds. The difference in costs between walling these maps are 157 wood, 198 seconds to complete the walls, and 386 seconds of villager work time when converting the wood cost over to the time it takes to chop it. In addition to being set back 157 more wood to wall, you have to start your walls 198 seconds earlier to have them up at the same time as the more easily wallable base. Of course, you can use multiple villagers to wall, but this hurts your early economy even more because now you have two or more villagers not collecting resources. This will slow down your military production, which will force you to play defensively, which lets your opponent be extra greedy at home. Since both you and your opponent's maps tend to spawn with the same number of wood lines, after scouting your own map, you can get a pretty good idea for how valuable walling will be over just military production. If the map has two wood lines or less, then it's a very open map, which decreases the value of walling and increases the value of military production. Since very open maps require earlier walling to complete them, you can scout whether your opponent intends to wall or not quite early. If you see a lot of palisade walls coming up from your opponent early, then you can decide to go for a strong opening against this such as men-at-arms into archers. Alternatively, since you know aggression will be late, you can play a little bit greedy yourself and wall later in favor of earlier farms instead of military production. The opposite of an open map is a closed map. This term is usually used to describe other maps such as Black Forest and Arena, but I'm using it here to describe the more easy to wall for Woodline Arabia. On this map, the value of walling is high and the value of military is lower. With four wood lines, you can get your base walls up quickly and cheaply, and if the opponent does decide to go for aggression, you have many options for making extra walls to your TC. On closed maps, you can adapt your strategy to include less military production and more economic investments such as earlier farms. It's not like aggression can't work on this kind of map, it's just less likely to work. If you play too greedy behind your walls, you can still die to heavy aggression if you're not careful, especially if you have more forward berries and gold. So now that we know about two or less and four woodline Arabia generations, what about the ones that have three woodlines? These tend to be the most common Arabia generations and are also arguably the most difficult to play well. This is where walling and military investment can be both about the same value, which means that you have to take into account not only the woodlines but other factors as well. The first thing to consider is the civilization matchup. You can start thinking about this from the moment you see your opponent's civ. If your opponent has a better civilization for going aggressive early, then you need to get your base set up in a way that you can deflect that pressure. Some common openings in order of earliest to latest attack timing are Drush, Men-at-Arms Archers, and Scouts. There are other openings as well, but for the sake of brevity, we'll focus on these three. Good Drush sieves include Lithuanians and Persians, which can do barracks before lumber camp to hit it around 4.5 minutes, Goths, who get a discount on their units, and Portuguese and Spanish who like to Drush to keep the opponent back while they wall and get to Castle Age fast. This is not an exhaustive list of all good Drush sieves, but just a small selection. For men-at-arms openings, Bulgarians is great because of free men-at-arms upgrade and cheaper blacksmith techs. Ethiopians gets 100 food and 100 gold at the start of Feudal Age, and has faster firing archers, so men-at-arms archers is good for them as well. Malians have cheaper buildings and extra pierce armor on their men-at-arms. Franks and Burmese each get one of their feudal ecotechs for free, which helps to afford this rush as well. There are so many sieves with bonuses that can be used for a strong men-at-arms archers rush, so you'll probably encounter this opening a lot. For scouts openings, almost any sieve can do it reasonably well. Sieves that have bonuses that help them hit extra fast with scouts are Franks, Mongols, and Lithuanians due to having more food to click Feudal Age earlier. 
Scouts tend to hit slower than men-at-arms because the scouts need to be built in Feudal Age after the stable is built, whereas Militia can be in creation at any time in Dark Age after the barracks is complete. If you want to learn a little bit more about the timings in which rushes hit, watch my video on rush timings after this one, the link's in the description. Against Drush, you'll probably be forced to make resource walls initially, which can leave you vulnerable to an archer follow-up later on. If you keep track of where your opponent's militia are, then walling the areas where they aren't can be fine, but it can be risky if they're constantly moving around your base. If you clean up the militia early, then you'll have tons of time to wall your map, as your opponent will get to Feudal Age late because of the cost of the militia. As the Drushing player, keeping your militia healthy is more important than doing direct damage. The threat of damage is often more than any actual damage that your militia can inflict on in a straight up fight. Against men at arms, you can usually get small walls up in time, but base walls will usually be denied. Proper scouting of the opponent's barracks timing and gold collection should give you ample time to plan out how you're going to deal with the men at arms. Since men at arms are often followed up with things that can shoot over walls, such as archers or towers, you can't just rely on resource walls unless you have your own military to defend the follow up. If you just resource wall your villagers while you open scouts, then your opponent will just walk across the map with an archer and a spearman and kill all of your scouts and villagers easily. Going for small walls is the design that you should use against men at arms. They come up early enough to stall the men at arms, and then they still protect you against the follow up. This is not always the case though. As with a lot of things in this game, it depends heavily on other factors as well, so you still have to use your brain when deciding which type of walls to go for. Going up against scouts can be the easiest to wall against. You can usually full wall your base, which will make your opponent's scouts much less effective unless there's an archer follow up. If you're up to feudal age at a reasonable time, you can protect your walling villagers with a spearman or two, which lets you delay your walls even longer. The longer you delay your walls, the more resources you have for other things earlier. Knowing your opponent's opening can help you get your walls not too early and not too late. In this way, scouting is heavily tied to how and when you make your walls. The civilization matchup isn't as simple as just the opening. Regardless of opening, if one civ gets a better unit composition in the late game, or has better bonuses for their economy, they might want to play the map in a way that they can get to the later stages of the game. This is where you must consider not only your civ, but your opponent's civ as well. If you're Mongols, and you're used to being able to kill everything with Mangadai in the late game, but now you're up against Berbers whose Camel Archers hard counter Mangadai, maybe you might want to go more aggressive throughout the game to finish it early, which may mean less walling. The same can be said for Mayans versus Goths. Mayans is such a strong Civ that has cheaper walls and some very strong eco bonuses, but if the game goes long, they don't have any good options against Huskrills. Instead of their usual full wall and boom game plan, the Mines player should try to end the game before the Goths is able to spam Huskarls. You might be thinking, how does considering the late game have to do with how I wall at the start of the game? Well, the way that you open directly influences the flow of the game. Have you ever walled early and then your opponent never stopped attacking you? Because you made walls instead of military early, your opponent was able to be the aggressor first, which led to you being the defender for the rest of the game. If you try to wall against an opponent who has a better civ for the late game, then you're just giving the opponent the initiative to either force you to play defensively by making military, or walling and booming leading to you dying in the late game. Thinking about the game in the long term can help you make better decisions in the short term. Of course, considering the civ matchup isn't only about thinking about the late game. Various castle age timings and early imp timings can also be taken into account. We won't go into the details on this though, otherwise we'll be here forever. You can think of walling as an inexpensive way to delay your opponent's army from moving to certain areas. The longer the wall, and therefore the more expensive it is, the less efficient it is to make. If you have a bad civilization matchup, then only walling high efficiency areas, such as between two wood lines or to the edge of the map, can give you more resources to make military to attack your opponent. No matter what opening you go for, having your berries in the back of your base can help you to keep your town center producing villagers, as it's much easier to defend. Having forward berries might force you to resource wall, even if you intend to go for small or base walls later. 
This can lead to over-investing into walls if you're not careful. If there isn't a good way to get larger walls up to protect your berries, then going for resource walls and military yourself can be better than trying to rely too much on walls. If your map allows for easy small walls from a wood line to your TC, then these are sometimes preferable to resource walls, especially against men at arms. They still might come up too late against Drush unless you really rush them out though. If your main gold is forward and you don't have easy access to a second gold in the back of your base, then you may have some issues if you can't secure it at some point. If you open scouts and then try to go straight to Castle Age after, you'll find that you can't take your gold against someone who went men at arms archers. In this situation, you really need to follow up your scouts with an archery range for your own archers or skirmishers. If you just try to go small walls and scouts when you haven't even secured any gold, then you'll find that you can never get to Castle Age. Even if you sell resources to go up, you won't have any gold to make knights or siege anyways, so you still can't take your gold. You can still go for scouts and small walls if you have forward gold, you just have to add a range so that you can secure it in Feudal Age. Alternatively, you can place a tower on your gold, but this shows your opponent that you'll either go heavy aggression in early Castle Age due to not being able to add TCs, or that you'll mine stone and then have a weaker boom because of it. Just because your opponent knows aggression is coming, doesn't mean he can stop it too, so if you really don't want an archery range, a tower to secure your gold is not a bad idea. The best kind of map that you can hope for is one where you have berries and gold in the back of your base. In this situation, it can be simple to small wall to the TC and have everything secured with very little investment. On this map, you can get your walls early for a cheap cost, which will give you more resources to make units or farms. This is the kind of map that you can consider going Drush Fast Castle, since your opponent might not be able to damage you even if you don't have any military. After you've thought about the Civ matchup and located your woodlines, berries, and main gold, the next thing to think about is where you want to prioritize your wall construction. Your villagers take time to build the walls, so getting them to start on high priority areas first will hopefully result in the walls being finished before the opponent attacks you. The first walls that you build should be on the front of your base or near resources that you want to protect. For example, the two houses after the first two can be placed in front of your berries if they're forward. These can later be linked to a nearby woodline with palisade walls in the barracks to complete them. If you aren't careful with your early building placement, then your walls later can end up being less useful. Take a look at this placement of my barracks and houses. If I were to place my buildings like this, it would wall out the northern woodline and leave my gold exposed to archers. Instead of placing them so far back, if I link these two wood lines together and place the archery range and a few palisade walls, then suddenly I'm protected against anything that hits later than a drush, and I even have a hill behind my walls that my military can stand on. This kind of small wall setup is great against men-at-arms archers. A small detail about the exact location of your walls is that you should place them as forward as possible while still walling the same amount of space. This gives you more space to make a second layer of walls behind, and also gives enemy ranged units less range to hit things inside your base. You also get extra line of sight on the map, which can help spot units in forward buildings. The disadvantage of placing them like this is that there may be more surface area for melee units to attack. Still, the extra space behind should allow you to make another layer of walls in time to prevent the enemy from getting in. Another thing to keep in mind is where your potential TC locations are. You don't want to place houses or production buildings in a location that you'll want to TC later, otherwise you'll have to delete them. Deleting palisade walls later on isn't a big deal though. Usually you'll want your first additional town center on wood, and the second one on a gold mine. If you can get a TC on both at the same time, then the other one can even be on stone if you want. I have a video that covers building placement, so check that out for more information. And that just about covers everything you need to know to have a basic idea of how you should wall, and if it might be better to just make more military instead of walls. When you want to go more aggressive, you should wall less so you have more resources for your attack. If your map is more open, or your opponent has a better civilization later on, then going more aggressive is better than walling more. Usually some form of walling should be used at some point in the game, be it resource, small, or base walls. If I missed any important information or you wish to add additional information, leave a comment down below. 
I've also released a separate video at the same time as this one where I've applied some of the ideas I've presented here to how I'd wall my map in the scenario editor. So there's another video for you to watch. Okay, thanks for watching. See you later.